ravi de, de pouvoir régulièrement avoir des cafés scientifiques. Alors on appelle ça café scientifique, même s'il n'y a pas de café. Euh, et, euh, mais c'est juste une occasion où on peut parler de science. Euh, on, est, on, a tourné, on a choisi de tourner l'établissement vers trois piliers, l'un étant les sciences et la technologie. Et donc on, on, on est ravi de, de pouvoir parler de, de façon régulière avec des scientifiques qui viennent nous voir. Et Monsieur Lévy, je tiens à vous remercier particulièrement pour... C'est un honneur de vous avoir parmi nous, euh, nous aujourd'hui pour nous parler euh, d'un aspect bien particulier de la science euh, et de la recherche euh, sur lequel vous avez travaillé euh, longuement. Et euh, donc je vais peut-être passer la parole euh, à, à mon collègue euh, professeur de, de sciences physiques et qui coordonne un petit peu tous ces cafés scientifiques, M. Lampère, pour présenter... Euh, Merci beaucoup. À propos du, du café scientifique, il n'y a pas de café, mais cela dit, après, on vous êtes quand même invité à prendre le verre de l'amitié et, et il y aura aussi quelques petites choses à manger. Donc, il euh, ne faut pas, faut pas se précipiter, bon, vous avez le temps de faire la présentation. Mais, so, euh, merci beaucoup à tous pour être là. Et donc, euh, M. Jay Levy, donc, qui est euh, chercheur euh, au, à UCSF et qui euh, fait de la recherche sur le, sur le VIH euh, depuis maintenant... Euh, 30, 35, au moins 35, au moins 35 ans. ans. Euh, vous avez travaillé sur d'autres sujets avant, un peu sur le cancer, mais depuis 30, 30 ans... Toujours ben, en virologie. Toujours en virologie, hein, sur ouais. le virologue. Euh, et, et donc, euh, euh, qui a été un des pionniers et qui a co-découvert, on peut dire, euh, le, le, le VIH au, dans les années 80, en 83, euh, et, euh, et qui travaille, donc, qui a beaucoup travaillé sur le traitement aussi du, du, du sang contaminé, sur le traitement thermique hein, du sang contaminé, il me semble. Et, et donc, il continue à faire des recherches et donc il va nous présenter ce soir son travail. So, you're going to present your work on, uh, on this, this, uh, this virus and on the, I think, the three or four aspects that you are working on, the cure, prévention, prévention, oui, traitement, prévention ah. et cure. Voilà, traitement, prévention. Okay. Okay. Merci beaucoup, M. Ah, Lévy. Merci. Merci. Je viens de parler en français pour ce sujet. Uh, je préfère maintenant changer pour ma, ma langue uh, maternelle, uh, mais j'aime beaucoup parler français. J'ai vécu trois ans, trois ans séparés à Paris et j'ai beaucoup apprécié la ville et je suis fier de francophone. Hein. So, in any case, uh, it was very interesting. I had spoken the, the science in, la, in French for such a long time that to just get all the The tatique and sa tatique, and it, it's a, it was a nice challenge. So I'm going to switch to English, as I said. And if you have any questions, let me know. But I know you both, you're all bilingual. Anyway, I got into this. I'm a virologist, and I uh, was survived in the 80s when I, I came back. Actually, I did a sabbatical at the Pasteur Institute. I did a part of it at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, and then came to the Pasteur. I worked with Francois Jacob, and uh, was always already in viruses, and then came back and uh, unfortunately uh, had there was a change in government, and money for research was really brought to a standstill, which is always our fear uh, in, in any situation with a change of government. So I was almost going to turn into which I said to your college council, I didn't tell her that, but I mean, for the students, they should be in liberal arts, because if you find that your profession is no longer appreciated, you better be able to change it to something else. So I have an outline of a book I was going to write, sort of a science fiction thing. Anyway, <laughs> uh, AIDS hit, and although the government was not favorable to any research or any uh, innovation that was done for that CEDA, um, it, uh, it, uh, it was a challenge for us living in San Francisco. But I also have to say, since uh, we're all francophone, that when I was at sabbatical in, in Paris, I worked with Francois with, uh, at, in Jacob's lab. But with Jacob, uh, Francois Jacob, which you all know, is a Nobel Prize winner in, for uh, genetic uh, 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 observations with genetic uh, control and uh, he did not want me to work in viruses in his lab even though he had mice that are full of viruses but he so I had to walk I don't know if you've ever been to the Pasteur but I had to walk across the central area and go to 
the lab of Luc Montagnier. So this is in 79, and I worked with Francoise Barre and Jean-Claude Jean Sherman. And so it, you gotta think it's kind of ironic that here I was working with them on mouth viruses at a time that HIV was already spreading in Africa. And then come back and continue to work with mouth viruses and then suddenly be hit by AIDS, which we called GRID in this, when first in the gay community, and uh, then find out that your colleagues in France are working on the same thing. And so we had quite a number of phone conversations. They got there for fast. Uh, discovering in early 83 and we found the virus and confirmed in, uh, in, uh, in uh, September of 83 and uh, I have a very close relationship particularly with, uh, with Francoise Barret. So I thought I'd start, it may take too long, uh, where's my, oh you can yes. push, push these ahead. Okay. I wish I had, I didn't have, but anyway uh, this just to get an idea for you in, in San Francisco, this was what 81 was the way AIDS was described. So you had, if you look at it, it really reads like a flu-like illness, which is still the way it is. Uh, you had a rash in many cases, sometimes not, but I always turn to this defect neurological function, which is extremely important, and of course the purpless herpes sores. So people would come in, They'd be this, they, they'd think it's a viral infection. They thought it was a, a common virus. And in San Francisco, we divided up and uh, we had a small group, very small, five or six people. I said, I think it's a new virus. Larry uh, they had others that thought it was maybe CMV, another group, herpes viruses. And we, were, we got along, we did very, very well. And we'll go to the next. And what the presentation was, uh, is people were presenting mostly in the gay community, which I first worked with, by Capuchin sarcoma, which is, I'll show you, but they were presenting as well with this pneumonia, which uh, was only found in severely immunosuppressed people, particularly if you have cancer, that you're on drugs that would immunosuppress you. Uh, next slide. And, and when you found that, you got a sputum specimen, but these, this is the parasite, uh, pneumocystis, which is later found not to be a, 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 a to be a fungus, uh, you never got a sputum like that. And I, I, I worked in infectious diseases. This was really severe. Next, and then this was Capuchy sarcoma that was described, and that was later next slide shown to be caused by a herpes virus, HHV8. And the next was a, a discovery by my colleagues in dentistry, uh, where they had people coming who had immune, immune suppression, immune inhibition, and they had this lesion on the side of the lung, could be in the buccal mucosa, and uh, Deb Greenspan and, and John Greenspan, and they just, they have, the, if you ever, now you don't see it, but when we saw it, it would be there, and then you had little t pieces of, of skin coming off, and it had a hairy nature to it, so they called it hairy leukoplakia, and it was the first, it, it was, the way that HIV and AIDS was discovered really first. If you didn't see it on the skin, if you opened the mouth, you saw it, then you knew they had AIDS. Next slide will show you that then they worked with uh, Evelyn Lynette, who's a close friend of mine as well, uh, to discover that it was another herpes virus, Epstein-Barr, which causes infectious mono. So if you want to come around full circle, you know as Epstein-Barr virus causes mono, mono's kissing disease. So we all say, now we know where the virus hides out. It's on the surface of the tongue. It's in the saliva. So it, while it's never been proven, it, it sits, if I had the, had the students here, uh, dendritic cells of the buccal mucosa and the tongue where it, the virus stays in a reservoir. Next slide. So this is San Francisco. It's really changed since this picture has been taken. But uh, as you know, next slide shows you an area where there was a high case of high amount of uh, HIV and AIDS, AIDS cases, next slide. And this is Dan Turner, was the first one I saw, 1981, Paul Volberding, who had just left my lab, who's uh, Mr. Treatment for HIV infection. He's a really prominent uh, physician. 
uh, had called me down. He'd just taken over head of cancer program at San Francisco General, and he introduced this man, and he said that he's got, cap he was a young man, 23, with Capuchin lesions on his skin, and they wanted to know what could cause it, and we hadn't yet known that the immune system was compromised, so I launched into a discussion of Capuchin sarcoma, which I had studied in Africa in the 60s as a medical student, and knew that by electron microscopy we had herpes particles. So everyone was thinking maybe it's herpes symptoms, the known herpes particles. Well, little did we realize till the discovery of HHV, there was a brand new herpes virus. Next slide. So with Dan Turner's blood, we went into the library. This was, there was a, the university was very, very frightened. They, they pushed us all, anyone working with HIV, they wanted it's in a little corner. You had a, you had, there was a little door, all this now is at the, I'm, I'm pleased to say at the Smithsonian Institute because they wanted to record what was done in the early days. So you walked in a small door, you, this was an ante room which was about this big, and then you had a, a biosafety hood here, and around the corner was a uh, was a uh, incubator, and they did allow me to put an a, a air conditioner in there, so it was an air conditioner, and they had a microscope, and that was the room. And we did all our work was mostly for cancer viruses, but this was where we then started to grow white cells. And next slide, and we were we saw this kind of change in cells from people with AIDS because we weren't seeing people at that time which I talked about with the students today that were healthy. We all people that came with AIDS and a lot of them, as you know. It was a terrible period in this in the city in the early 80s and people were dying and if they weren't dying they were extremely ill. No one knew what to do and people were, the docs were uh, really quite frightened uh, and the community was quite frightened. Anyway, this is a cytopathic changes which occur if you put white cells in culture and you'll see what we call this ballooning and if you come, uh, people visit the lab, we we'll always have cells that show this, where this is because the virus disturbs the membrane of the cell, so as sodium and potassium ions come in and they carry water with them, so you get these balloons and they burst. So if you have, spend too much time under the microscope, the heat causes them to burst. But it is uh, quite dramatic. Next slide. Uh, and then through that we were able to uh, do electron microscopic pictures with Min and Oshiro, who was my mouse leukemia virus, it's a retrovirus electron microscopist, and he took these pictures and we, re we named the virus the AIDS-associated retrovirus, or ARV, and this abnormal nucleus is classic for a lentivirus, which a lot of the community did not recognize, we, we recognized because I've been in retroviruses a while, and this is the virus that causes equine infectious anemia in horses, which devastates the horse uh, industry and has had institutes all through Japan. And that was, this is one of the first viruses, virus because you could take material from the horse, filter it through a filter, and give it to another horse and get equine infectious anemia destroyed the horse, the horse racing industry. Really, uh, quite an effect. It was the second virus discovered in the world. The first one was the wart virus. So it's pretty dramatic that now we've got a virus that's really created an epidemic that was discovered early 1900s and, and gives us AIDS. Next slide. So here it is, and all these blue circles are the virus budding from a white cell. It's a CD4 lymphocyte. And it is a, there are about a thousand particles being produced, but they are mostly dead because the virus is very inefficient, but it helps it because it keeps, keeps replicating and makes a lot of mistakes. And so most of the mistakes lead to a non-infectious virus, but there's always one that takes over. Next slide. And uh, we named this virus, so the French called it LAV because of a patient that had lymphadenopathy syndrome. The NIH group called it HTLV3 and we called it ARV and we had a committee meeting and they said let's change it to HIV, human efficiency virus. Well we did make the connection so you can see, you'll know our viruses because we, we were put a sub, sub, uh, sub uh, species, a subset uh, SF for San Francisco and most of the other groups didn't bother doing that so all our viruses are that. We got up to 247 of these. 
and each person we discovered had a different virus, which is a huge, huge surprise. I'll be a little catty here because the NIH group got this virus from Montagnier, re, re isolated it, called it a different name, and then it was the same virus, exactly the same virus. And we were the ones that showed that every virus is different, so they realized that it wasn't an independent isolation. Next slide. So, uh, where are we today with this? I mean, imagine just uh, 81 with a few cases hitting the gay community. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Atlanta, New York. It's about it, Miami. Miami is among Haitians and they all blamed it on Haiti, uh, that the virus came from Haiti, but essentially it was New York. Gay community went to Haiti and introduced it there. So uh, it, it came, as we know, from the Cameroons and, and uh, Dr. Dr. Lambert did some work in the Cameroon, so it's interesting. Uh, quite a surprise, most people didn't know where Cameroon was, and then that's the center of where HIV was first isolated uh, and found, and it's uh, believed to come from the chimpanzees. I, have a, I don't know when it came, but it's similar to uh, the viruses in chimpanzees. So we got 60, it's the worst epidemic that hit, uh, 76 million people. Uh, 1.8 million infected past year 20 last year was less uh, 37 36 million living with it 35 million deaths the key is that in the ones in the United in the uh, HIV there are 39,000 new infections which is down from what it was down to, it was 50,000 before but most important is and I don't have it here is one in four people infected in the United States that's of the the total in the United States is about a million, don't know their effect. So we really have to continue the campaign to get people in and be tested. This is in the U.S. This is all U.S. Uh, yeah, no, no, this is the international. This is Next slide. Okay, so how does it differ from all the other type of pathogens, you know, Ebola or, or flu or some uh, the, the, the smallpox? Attacking the immune system is not unusual, but it really hits the major cells of the immune system. The virus becomes part of the chromosome of the cell, and that I'm going to show you is really dramatic. It's true of all retroviruses, but it never been encountered with the human virus. Chronic infection, it keeps changing, and it can get other cells into the infection. So these are the reasons why it's such a difficult one. Next slide. So let's just look at what, uh, no, go backwards. I went too fast. Uh, okay, next slide. So uh, let's look at the virus and what it, what it does in terms of a challenge for control. Next slide. So I'll go quickly. This just shows you there are two types of HIV. Uh, you know, there are three types of polio. There are three types, two types. But if you go to the next one, there are also out of each type, there are subtypes and all of them differ. The types differ by 40%, the subtypes differ by 15%, and every subtype can be different by 1%. So that's why you can't say I have discovered the virus when it looks exactly like the one that someone else found. And if you go in a virus infection of triplets, all three triplets will have the same virus. It's the immune system that influences the replication. Okay, next slide. So, I'm going to show you a, a, a animation of how the virus replicates. Here's the virus. It's got two strands of RNA, which is genetic material for the virus. And remembering, for those of you who forgot your, your, uh, your biology, the cell contains a chromosome. It's made from DNA. The DNA gives rise to a, a replicate of the DNA called RNA. The RNA gives rise to a protein. So as long as that's acting fine, the chromosome directs what's going on in the cell and makes all the proteins that are there. This virus then goes and becomes part of the chromosome. And yeah. So here it comes, attaches to the surface of the cell. It injects its, its uh, capsid in. One of the strands of RNA forms a DNA copy of itself. So it's the reverse of what we normally would do, DNA to RNA. So it's RNA to DNA, 
the DNA becomes what we call a double helix, the famous double helix, helix of Watson and Crick, and that's exactly what the chromosome looks like. So it goes into the cell and becomes part of the chromosome of the cell, and from that it keeps producing the RNA from the DNA, the RNA, and the RNA becomes the genome of the virus, and part of it gives rise to proteins such as the envelope, and then the virus material, the cavity, goes to the surface of the cell, it buds from the cell, it does not necessarily kill the cell. So you watch that again, it buds out, and what's, what's really key, when this was all described, not new, this is what classic retroviruses were doing, yeah, they weren't doing much with the equine virus, but mouse retroviruses they were, so it had never been described for humans. So you have the capsid and the RNA making a DNA, the reverse of the genetic code, not DNA to RNA, RNA to DNA, so that's reverse transcription, reverse transcriptase is the enzyme. When it comes here, it integrates, the enzyme is called integrase, and here it buds out, and it's very important, it wasn't known, but when it buds out, it's immature. It's not infectious. It takes a while for the protease enzyme that's in, in the particle to cut the proteins in the right form and then becomes infectious. So what drugs do we have? Against reverse transcriptase, against integrase, and against protease. And then they have some that block the side. But most of your patients are now going to be on reverse transcriptase inhibitor and an integrase inhibitor. And if the virus is allowed to replicate, it will change and it'll do almost like the biblical expression, be fruitful, multiply, because it will eventually become faster replicator, faster, cause more death, add more viruses, and it'll go to the various tissues. It takes about two weeks after the infection to get to the brain. It sets up an infection in the brain and most people that are trying to do a cure forget that you've got a reservoir in the brain. So it's tough. Next. And I think go to the next one. Uh, next one? Yeah, just go to the next one. So what we were able to see is that the early virus is not as pathogenic as, uh, as, as disease causing as the later virus and that's what happens. It evolves to become worse and this virus uses a different way of getting in, but is the less common. This is the one that more is one of the first ones to be passed. And it is because the next slide shows because it is found in most of the infected cells of genital fluids. So this again is the, the two major messages that I usually tell to the students and to the public is one is this virus becomes part of a cell. So it becomes part of a cell, you're not going to use a polio approach to anything because the polio infects by a free particle. This one infects the cell and becomes part of the genetic material of the host. And that cell can pass the virus. Next slide. Where is that cell? This is obviously seminal fluid. We studied the uh, cells in seminal fluid and uh, vaginal fluid too. What on a slide where we've done, this is where we're detecting RNA being made, we are able to predict that 5% of the white cells in an ejaculate are infected by HIV. So, I should, I mean, I didn't do this for the students, but two million cells are in a normal uh, uh, ejaculate, and half of them are, are germ bodies, and the other half are, are white cells. Most of them are macrophages. That's why that R5 virus is going to be more common in that. And this then can get spread. Here is a CD4 cell, or yes, CD4 cell, interact with cells of the cervix. You can't infect them, the cervix, with virus alone. But having, this vir having the cell interact at the interface, you can see the little dots, it's being passed to the cervix. Probably because there are cellular products that allow the cervix to be infected. So one, just remember this, that what are we doing in vaccine trials is we're always challenging the animal with free virus. When we really should be worried about this, it's too difficult to do. Next. Okay, why is it spread again? Uh, I think go fast, uh, Stefan. So 
people can remain healthy for 10 years and never show. That's where we were really surprised. Next, the virus can be transmitted by an infected cell. I showed you next. It's spread by sexual transmission. We never controlled sexual transmission, we, even with all the antibiotics, uh, for anything, any infection. It mutates and it becomes resistant to immune system. So this is why it's different from a lot of the other agents we talk about next. So transmission, sexual, hasn't changed, sexual contact, next. Blood and blood products, that we've cleaned up very well. And maternal child, there are rarely any, because of the antiretroviral drugs, there are rarely any children born infected today. Mm -hmm. Mothers are treated during pregnancy, the child is treated after birth, and so we've gotten it down to almost zero. It's really in the underserved communities where we're seeing some of this, some of this transmission. Next. And just to give you an idea of why it's such a challenge, give you an idea of where the research community has been, and we've done a lot of this. These are all the cells of the hematopoietic system, the skin, the brain, the heart, the kidney, the liver. All of them have a cell that could be infected by HIV. And it depends on which virus gets them, if your virus has it next. So this is an example. This is Slim's disease, which if you went to Africa, you'd see. Now it's much less, although I just came back from Malawi, and I, we could see this is malnutrition, chronic diarrhea. Um, uh, <coughs> they lose weight, and they, it's a very severe form of AIDS. Go ahead. And what we were able to show is that in the bowel itself, there are and intestinal cells that are infected. This is all done by what we call PCR. PCR is a great, it was a great discovery where you can pick up RNA or DNA by using just a copy of what you say. So you take a, a, a genetic marker for HIV and just search through fixed tissue and you can find what cells are making that virus. You can make a DNA, it'll you know, interact with the RNA. And the, so that's a very important. Next slide. This is in the kidney. Cells in the kidney are infected. Next slide. Uh, and as you all know, people who are uh, who progress to disease lose the most, the major part of their immune system, the CD4 white cell, which is a helper cell that helps the immune system function well. Whereas people who survive for a long time, these are in months, they have a normal range of CD4 cells, which you can see is 500 to 1200. Next. So that's the that's fine. That's the virus. Uh, then let's go through the host. Um, so I'll just keep it as this. This gives you an idea of the simplest way of describing the immune system, where the bone marrow and stem cell gives rise to the thymus, gives rise to T cells. This gives rise to B cells. And you have this interaction of all the different immune cells. And we're going to, we are very interested in this cell, which is a cell that fights the virus. Here's a CD4 cell, this is a CD8 cell. Next slide. So I, I always like I, <clears throat> showing this slide is because not only do the cells interact, but the products of the cells. So these are what we call cytokines. They all interact and are part of the uh, normal function. So whenever I show that, I show the next one, which this group should recognize, which <laughs> is, I usually say, I think it looks like the metro map in Paris, and they then understand the interconnection. Okay, the next one. All right, so we are studying people who have survived more than 10 years without therapy, normal CD4 numbers, very low amount of virus in their blood, they have, and then there's some that we're, we're studying in our lab now, elite controllers, which have no virus in their blood. They really are controlling it. And we are, con we are convinced, which is natural, that it is the immune system, the defense mechanism in your body that does this protection. Next slide. And this is done by the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So I'll just quickly show you. Next slide. There's a difference between the innate and adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is the first line of defense against any germ or pathogen. And it happens in minutes to days. It is, in fact, 
the thing that's protecting you all the time. There's, uh, pneumocystis is in the air all the time. You breathe it into your nostrils, you have it into your lungs, it's destroyed by the innate immune system. Your skin is challenged all the time. If we didn't have this, we'd be pretty darn sick. And people, some people are born with that parts of the innate immune system and they are very sick. They can't handle infections. It's the innate immune system that holds the infection in place until the adaptive can come. And the adaptive takes days to weeks. All of them are conserved. I think we'll just go to the next one. Uh, the innate immune system has been around a long time. It, is con it has been said that we can date back the origin of the innate immune system uh, 100 million years. And it became the adaptive immune system when the shark developed its mandible. And it occurred, when I told the students today, when a retro, a virus-like particle that it's like HIV, a retrovirus, entered a primitive immune cell in the shark and gave rise to B cells and T cells. And it took time, but that's the origin. So they all conserved. But that has a lot of different components of the innate immune system. Next. Uh, this is, for instance, the NK cell. You may read about it. It's a natural killer cell. It was found by chance, and it was one, a cell that just naturally kills anything that doesn't look normal. And so it kills cancer cells, it kills HIV infected cells, it has to be programmed and, they, and the cells and the cancer cells and the virus infected cells have ways of combating. But this shows you an electron micrograph of the NK cell killing a cancer cell. Next slide. And the adaptive immune system, of course, is uh, more focused, as I, I, I was saying. You've had time to develop something that really can focus and kill off the pathogen. And there are just a small group of them. But they are all part of an interplay of the innate and adaptive. Next. And there's, for example, an electron microscope. There's what a lymphocyte looks like. Next slide. And this is a macrophage which plays a role in both the innate and the adaptive. The macrophage lives up to its name, which if you've done Latin, the macro for large, phage is e. Greek, it's Greek and Latin, that they take up, there's, the macrophage puts out its projection and grabs the bacterium, digests it, and then puts on its cell surface the proteins of that bacterium or the virus, and your immune system recognizes it. So it is a, it is a promoting cell for the immune system. Dendritic cells are very similar. Next slide. So we now are able to put together the story to say that macrophages or dendritic cells, which are similar uh, in a family, but they also are extremely important for presenting on their cell surface the proteins or the, the, the makeup of a virus, bacteria, tumor cell, whatever, that interacts with cytokines with a helper cell. The helper cell with cytokines then alert the CD8 cell. And this will then this will also go to NK cell. So, so you see that you've got to have the dendritic cell or the macrophage in order to get the whole thing going. Next slide. <clears throat> now that takes care of eliciting the cells that are coming and kill. But then we got to look at what antibodies do. And this is the surface of the AIDS virus. It's the envelope. It's called GP120. The C stands for conserved regions. That means most of the most of the envelope of the virus, that yellow triangle I showed, will be conserved, and then the rest is variable. Unfortunately, the variable region is what takes over. But if you could get a vaccine that will hit all the conserved regions, you may have a good vaccine that will treat us, treat Africa, treat Australia, and so forth. Next slide. I think go to the next slide. So <clears throat> I've sort of gone through, we heard the virus, how it changes and everything. Virus infected cell, that's the most important message. We go to the host and we say, you've got cells that are important for defending it, as well as antibodies. And now you've got to say, how is it that we can get people who can survive? I have people coming to my lab who are first documented in 1978 to have antibodies to HIV and they're perfectly healthy. 
They were part of a study of the gay community for hepatitis B. So you're at, all, you're at 40 years. They don't need any drugs. Well, they're told to tell, take drugs. I'm, I'm against that. They're perfectly healthy. And the whole reason is their, their defense against HIV, which is the immune system, and it's mostly the cellular immune system. Next. So here's the introduction to what we found. So it, go back to October 1984. We had, we had been described as finding the virus, and we started ta uh, seeing people who thought they were infected. They wanted to know if they were infected, and we had a way of doing it. So this man, <coughs> healthy, infected, he's a gay man, came, and we, his immune system looked fine, we thought. We put his cells in culture which is in plastic dishes and we grow the cells and we found virus in them. He's perfectly healthy. So you had him come back every month and then after April of 1985, we never could find virus in his white cells. So you start asking yourself, where is it? Well, maybe there aren't enough target cells for the virus. So you look here and you find the number of CD4 cells which as you remember, 500 to 16, 1,500, were only 300, but he had virus. Here he had over 1,000. So this was very dramatic. I explained that today. This is in 86, Chris Walker was in my lab as an immunologist. When we described this, it was a shock to the community because here's a virus that destroys the immune system. Here we have somebody who's perfectly healthy. What's doing it? And we said, must be the immune system. And that was the most promising and hopeful thing for people where there's no therapy. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you is that what we were able to show was that the CD8, which is a T cell that attacks, vir attacks cancers and virus infected cells was controlling the virus. So I think this is gonna be, yeah. So this animation, here's the white cells in, in a liquid culture. We remove the CD8 cells using antibodies to the CD8 cell. We can remove it. And when we do, we had the big discovery that HIV was hidden in those white cells. But it was being controlled by these CD8 cells. Now, if you were in immunology, you would learn that the CD8 cell takes care of cancer cells and virus-infected cells by killing them. So you imagine our surprise in 1985 when we found this, we said, why didn't the CD8 cell kill the virus infected cell? They shouldn't be there. When we take them out, there shouldn't be any virus. So that was the first clue, next slide, to the fact that when we added back CD8 cells, they could have been, our, we could have kept them in a separate culture. We'd add them in three weeks after. You block virus implication. So we immediately wrote this up and, and published it. And this is what was got a lot of publicity. Yes, next slide that we had discovered a different function of the CD8 cell. It's known to be cytotoxic and kill. This was brand new, suppressing. It could suppress, not kill the cell, but just let the cell continue to function. And my colleagues would say, why would you want a CD8 cell like that? You want to get rid of the virus infected cell. But I've already told you that the virus spreads so rapidly, it's in the brain. You want to kill off all your brain cells? every infected cell killed. I think this is a natural way of controlling the virus because you're blocking it after it integrates. So it's just blocked, can't express itself. We, are, we still have that debate and the suppressing activity, however, is the one thing that is associated with this long-term survivor. Go ahead. And you can find in long-term survivors much, three times the effect of the CD8 cells when you talk to progressors, most of the progressors have progressed because they don't have that activity anymore. Next slide. So uh, uh, what we found was this is, remember the CD8s are mixing with CD4s infected cells. Well, what happens if we separate them? So there's a device you can get in the lab, which is called a trans well. It's got a filter th through the center of this cup and on the bottom of the cup, you put CD8 cells, and on the top of the cup, with the on top of the filter, are the infected CD4 cells. And what we found was 
the CD, CD8, CD8 cells are producing some factor we call the CD8 antiviral factor that suppresses the virus. So you don't need the infected, you don't need the CD8 cells, you need the product of the CD8 cells. Next. And we found that this CD8 factor blocked the RNA production of the integrated virus, didn't kill the cell. So back to my argument that this may be a way in which these cells, by the way, once you blocked it, they can respond normally to certain stimuli. So we think they can function. We have never, we haven't been able to really prove they function normally, but we assume they do. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the kind of image that I leave people with when I talk about our work. We are now trying to identify the CD8 factor. It's produced in extremely small amounts. So to identify it's, go, it's taken not only the, 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 the uh, approach of mass spectrometry, which won't work here because in mass spectrometry, which, which can measure by, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, mass spec, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it to you, uh, very low amounts of protein, but not, not this low amount. It's a very robust protein. So we go to molecular techniques and we're looking to see is the genes expressed by a cell that's producing this different than the genes that are in another? And that is what we're in the midst of doing now. Next, go ahead. So uh, I thought that, that brings you up to a long history of 30 years of work. What have we got recently that would, uh, would help in our advancement of knowledge about HIV? So uh, first of all, look at all these drugs we've developed. It's quite an industry. These are drugs that can be taken th three drugs at a time. Two to reverse transcriptase and one to the integrase. The integrase is one of the most powerful drugs. It took the hardest to find a molecule to block the integration, but that is the most powerful. Here are two drugs, and then these are all the others. There's no question that in this country we can treat Every, but almost everybody, but when you get resistance, you need to change everything again and then again. And we still have people dying of AIDS, but it's very rare. Which means that there's a campaign in San Francisco to put everybody on drugs. Now, since I uh, know what happens when you put everybody on antibiotics, which you all should know too, you find resistant bugs. So while we have all these, there'll be a moment I'm fearful of, where none of these are gonna work anymore and we're gonna need more drugs. Next, next slide. There are other targets besides the three enzymes or the surface. There are inside the cell itself ways in which the virus may not replicate as well. So if you increase those interest, intrinsic factors, you might be able to control the virus. So they're working on ways of upregulating some of these intrinsic antiviral factors that are inside the cell. Next. And so I'm going to just pick up two other things and, and you've been very attentive. The other, the first is what about a vaccine? So I hope I've given you enough hints as to why when people say to me, Dr. Levy, when are we going to have a vaccine? So I'm reminded of a visit that I made to my niece's Baldwin School in Philadelphia when she was eight years old and I gave a talk, she's now 32. Uh, and I said to, uh, and, and one of her, she was able to be there, I got a big kick out of because I asked her what she liked about the talk. She said, when you mentioned my name. So I realized mm -hmm. she, I didn't have to worry about telling all the in details of HIV spread. But essentially, a 15-year-old came up to me and said to me, Dr. Levy, I'm part of the cl HIV club, and uh, this is over, over 20 years ago, and she said, when are you going to vaccine? I said, how old are you? She said, I'm 15. I said, when you're 35. Well, she's now 37. So, it's a tough challenge. Uh, these are some of, these are what you want. You want to curtail the infection, sell your B cells and T cell responses, neutralizing antibodies, and be safe. Next. <clears throat> These are why, if anyone asks you why you can't get a vaccine, yet, becomes part of the cell. So 
So if the cell's transmitted, you better have a way of getting rid of the cells. You can if you locally have white cells that can fight, or even if our white cell is there, suppresses the virus, it can't spread, eventually that cell dies. Transfer can take place, numerous variants, and the virus compromises the immune system. Next. Um, let's go on because I think, uh, what, I, what I thought you'd see is the first phase three trial, phase one is safety, phase two is efficacy and a little bit of safety, and phase three is huge trial, many people, do you have something that protects? And this was done, Don Francis uh, pioneered this, you probably know about it, uh, Vaxgen, where they made a, um, took a pox virus and presented the proteins of the genetic material of HIV to pre give rise to the proteins that would be part of the HIV. And then they boosted, prime boost, they boost with envelope protein itself. So look what it, it so the discovery, they used the virus, they actually used our envelope for this group, the envelope from our SF2. And you go from 84 when they started working on it and had a vaccine in 03. So that's even, that's a vaccine that didn't work. If you were around, it was on the stock market. My cousin actually invested quite a lot of money in this. I told him I didn't think it was a good idea because I knew, but he did it anyway, got a good PR. It didn't work, unfortunately. Okay, next. Look what's involved now. Jonas Salk or Zabin never had this problem. <clears throat> you need a huge number of people to do it with. You have to have a lot of volunteers to be involved. You need, you need to have, uh, uh, it's not down here, is it? Let me see. There's also, you have to go to human trials. You have to get permission for all these different areas, go through uh, uh, peer review. Next slide, 280 million for that one. That was done earlier. So give you an idea when people say, well, you should have a vaccine by now. This gives you an idea of how long it's taken for viruses that we know of today. So the polio virus was discovered 47 years ago. It took 47, and, you know, it took that long. So HIV is now in more than 30 years. Um, I think we have a very long time. Next slide. Okay, so I th th it's sort of fun to end up with certain, we, we are trying to do a vaccine and it's very tough uh, because it's, it's an innovative approach where we're trying to give a vaccine with what we call an adjuvant, with com chemicals or compounds that will improve the immune response. But this is an interesting story, which is what uh, is fun for, for people to appreciate. Jani Yamamoto, who was at Davis as a postdoc, discovered the virus that causes AIDS in cats. So you know, AIDS is in cats, horses, uh, monkeys, cows. Where did that virus come from? I don't know. But there was a, she was in Gain, moved to Gainesville, Florida and set up her, her, her uh, lab there. And someone called and said, uh, there were some clinics, they said, we have a young man here who we has, it looks like he's got uh, an, he, he's got a reaction. He came for HIV testing and he's, found, he's got an HIV test that's positive. And he says, he claims he's not have any risk factors to be involved. So he, he left and he said, the only thing I've been, I don't know any friends that have HIV, the only one that has AIDS is my pet cat. So they called Janet on the phone and they said, do you think there's a cross-reaction between the cat virus and the human virus? And she did the test, and indeed she found that he would respond to HIV, and he responded to the cat virus. He didn't have the cat virus, he had an immune response against the cat virus, which he was exposed to through his pet cat. So the next slide, I think. And then she came to my lab, and we were able to show that <coughs> HIV, that this person, had CD8 responses, not, I'm not talking the CD8 suppression, but he did have that, thing. but to the gag protein, the surface, uh, the, uh, the protein makes up the core of the virus, and she could immunize a cat with the HIV cure protein, P, P, the cats in protein, P24, and the cats were protected from challenge with it. 
So we're trying to get support to use cat antigens, which would not be even the cat virus, to create a vaccine for HIV. Next slide. Uh, and the other thing that uh, we started, and I'm very pleased to know it's being continued now, is I, uh, as I mentioned, I did a sabbatical at the Pasteur Institute, and, what, and I'm very active in the programs here. Not a relative, but Avi Levy came through the Bay Area and gave a talk. He talked about manipulation of tomato, tomato plants, and I said, do you think we could get tomato plants to produce HIV proteins? He said, send me the, send me the genome, and we'll put it in a tomato plant and see what happens. So they put it in the tomato plant, got its cotyledons, got them to uh, <coughs> grow into uh, uh, the early parts of the plant. Next slide. And he got plants growing, and he grinded up the leaves, and he found HIV proteins. Now the thing that uh, was not known, and <laughs> so the, the thing we were not able to do because the funding ran out, was to see whether it was in the tomato itself. But I always like telling the story. I gave this talk at some at one group, and someone raised their hand and said, Dr. Levy, why did you do it in tomato plants? Because if you want to do something in monkeys, you should do it in bananas. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but, but we don't have anyone that's manipulating bananas. Next slide shows you. So someone in the audience sent me that picture and said, don't worry, <laughs> they will eat tomatoes as well. So we haven't gotten to that stage, but I am now in communication that project has gone to India. They, they are very excited by it, and they're doing the project in India. We just sent them some materials to continue the work. So I gave this talk in Malawi, and I showed this, and someone raised their hand and said, are you saying that we would eat and get immunized against a virus? I said, yes. You could imagine edible vaccines. You could have a bowl of fruit. You give it to your child, and each fruit has an image in that will not protect you against childhood disease. I mean, you still have to, you have to have the idea and you may be able to bring it about. So I think I'll stop there because it's been a long talk. Uh, we are trying to do cure through, through certain manipulations of human stem cells, but I think you get a good idea as to some of the challenges we went through and what we face in the future. So thank you all very much. I don't know if you have any questions, but uh, I'm happy to answer some. Do you have any? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to, to, to get the, the fact that usually when people have HIV, what we learn is that they will have 10 years without symptoms. I mean, they are just seropositive, but then suddenly after usually 10 years, the disease like declares or something. Yeah. What triggers? You know, so what so what it takes 10 is? years for them to get symptoms. Yeah. And the reason it takes that long is that the immune system, you don't have actually symptoms of HIV. You have symptoms of the diseases that occur as a result of the immune system being destroyed. So it takes so, 10 years to destroy. So yeah, it takes 10 years with the CD4. Some people take five, the average is 10 years. So if indeed the long-term survivors, they go, 40 years, they're able to maintain their CD, CD4 count in their immune system because they have an immune response that works against the virus, which is shocking. But if you think we've got 7 billion people on this planet, the genetic diversity would say there are some that are going to be naturally resistant. That's what you're seeing. It's about 1% of infected people will last that long, gets even less. And uh, that's where we can learn what's the best way of improving it through, I think, immune therapy, which is where we're working, or what do they know that we can get an immune reaction with the vaccine, which, by the way, none of the vaccines are measuring our CD8 suppressing activity. They're looking at different types of immune responses. It just, it just irks me. But uh, they are very classic immunologists who don't yet buy into a different type of response. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, it does take 10 years for it to appear, but it, would it be possible to stop it before it appears, for example, during that 10 year span to see if yes. it's there? Yes, that's a good point. The, what's the big, one of my, someone I was trying, 
take you back to the mid 80s. The only way you knew HIV infection took place was you were sick. Then we had an, we, we were among the first to have a good antibody test to see if you had antibodies to it. But it takes you maybe two months to develop antibodies. So you could be passing the virus all that time and never know you're infected. So now they got even super, super sensitive antibodies. Yes. But the first thing that appears after an infection within two days is virus in the blood. Why can't we detect virus in the blood? Well, it took engineering to do that. How do they do it? They take the blood, they rupture the virus, little mounts may be there, they use PCR. They use a PCR reaction to know is there any genetic material of HIV floating in the blood? Well, initially, they can detect a, hundred, a thousand particles. Now, a hundred. Last week, I was told in the elite controllers where you can't find any virus in their blood, they're down to half a virus particle they can detect. That's where engineering and, and creativity, well, I think it's more engineering. They just know do better, better, better. So that's what you do. Someone comes in and says, you know, I've, I had uh, contact with someone I think is infected. Could be a male, female, what? And uh, could you check? Did you have a fever like a flu-like illness? If they did, that's a sign. It might be the flu, but it might be this. So you check. They may not have antibodies yet, but they'll have virus. So they'll do a viral load. What they do in the blood bank now, they don't, the antibody is, that's almost not needed. They look at viral load. Are there people donating blood in which there's a small amount of virus in them, in the blood? So uh, they, don't, they don't need to do that. Now, if you want, if, you, uh, if they find virus there, there are some people that say you should treat them immediately. If you treat them immediately, you will curtail the symptoms, that's true. But I always like to say, if you start treating them immediately, then, then you, are, you are almost forced to give them years and years and years of treatment until we find a better way. And these drugs are like chemotherapy. So you think about it, you're gonna treat a cancer patient for 40 years, there's gonna be some downside. But you can't say that because these are life-saving drugs. So you've got to make a decision. Do you treat right away or not? Well, it, apparently, if you treat right away, they, they claim the virus hasn't spread as far. But then you, they've tried to stop treatment after you put them on it for maybe a year. And in some cases, very rare, the virus doesn't come back. Well, it doesn't come back for three, four months, then it comes back. Can you imagine if you're a researcher? Isn't that interesting? Why does it come back? What, why is it even controlled? They, might eat, they don't even have antibodies because you treated them so early, the antibodies didn't know there's a virus around. So there's a lot to work on as a researcher. But we have come a long way so that now, if someone comes in, they're all eat their ass, or they don't even now have to be asked, I think. They come in with, it looks like the inflammatory, they just order an HIV test. It has to be confidential, but they just do it. I've come a long way in the 35 years that I've been working in this area. So uh, we should be able to respond, but we'd like to come in with something to boost their immune system so we don't need to use these antiviral drugs. So you know where my lab's going. Some other, is there other questions? Yeah. yeah you were talking about the Cameroon and how, how AIDS were coming from, how HIV sorry, was, was coming from, probably from chimpanzee? Or well, if you look, this, this for me is controversial, but not with most of my colleagues. If you look at the chimpanzee virus, it is 40% uh, similar to our virus. And they claim for it to change into our virus, it would probably be, it got introduced through, through someone got cut with the chimpanzee virus uh, in 1930. They do a molecular clock. But then, you've got to ask, what, where, did the, where did the cat virus come from? Where did the horse virus come from? 
doesn't it make sense that the chimpanzee got it and we are primates so ours is going to look like a primate virus now maybe it did come from a chimpanzee but don't tell me in 1930 it would crossed over they did it because the the natives in africa like bush meat and the cutting up the bush meat they would cut their hand and that's where it'd be introduced far as i know as far as i'm concerned it's fine it fit it fits the pattern people want to where does it come from they say from chimpanzees where cameroon why cameroon because all of the subtypes that i showed you are found in cameroon so whatever evolved came from and that's not a big country so it means uh the the reservoir is pretty wide how are we doing any other question okay fine no, thanks just, all. no i have another one yeah uh, about the the, the, the medicine, uh, the, the molecules of chemistry that we are giving the, uh, the treatments, the chemical treatments, is it still now it's causing people a lot of side effects? Very, yes, it does have side effects. It does. It does, but rare. I mean, rare. Uh, if you, on tenofovir, some of them, you get kidney disease, uh, liver disease, pancreatic disease, but it is so rare that uh, people will take you off, they'll try to mod modulate, that that's not a reason for not taking it. So I have a big battle because I'm studying people who naturally are defending themselves against the virus with a great immune system. If you start giving them the drugs, they're on it for the rest of their life. You can't stop it. So why? So fortunately, people come to my lab and say to their doc, I'm sorry, I'm part of the Levy cohort and I don't need this drug and I'm convinced I don't need it and they lay off of it because there are certain physicians in this city who feel the same way if you don't need the drugs don't take them there are others who say you need the drugs because if you have a virus you better be treated for it but we're not all treated for EBV we're not all treated for herpes simplex we're not all treated for uh, several other viruses that we carry for a lifetime so you see where uh, my voice is being heard. It's not that many people, 1%. So you're talking about a small number of people who'd say, don't treat these people. Otherwise, they're all on it. And if you start treating people who don't really need it, they don't take it, they get a little fatigued, and, and then they stop taking it. And what's true of these bugs is that you, you saw they replicate and they keep changing they're going to naturally have a virus that's resistant to one of the drugs. Just, just numbers, a thousand particles a day. So if you have a little bit of the, anti, of the antiviral drug in your blood, the virus that has just a little bit of resistance to that drug is going to take over. It's going to replicate. And it's going to select for the virus particle that grows best in the, in the environment of that drug. That's how resistance occurs. It doesn't induce resistance, it selects for it. So you have to change drugs? On yeah, so what happens is some of my patients come in and they, they, they were found that they still had virus in their blood and the physician says, I don't want any virus in your blood. Mm -hmm. See, I think they're wrong, but they, I don't want any virus in their blood. So they cha have to change all three. Well, they can try, they can do genetic testing and see if you have the resistance for one of the drugs. But to change, to just change one of the three is generally not recommended. So you saw they have a lot. They can change uh, from Combavir to Donavir, uh, one of the other drugs, which doesn't, which is totally different. We're lucky now we have over 30 different drugs. Uh, we're essentially in wonderful shape. And what the program, the San Francisco General Group, HIV Group, is they want to be able to announce that San Francisco is HIV free. Now, what they mean is they've had no, zero transmission. All right, so my prediction is zero transmission for a couple of weeks until you get something coming in that's resistant to whatever someone's taking, and then it takes over, and then you come in again with more drugs. You come in again. We need a vaccine, or we need something to boost the immune system, so you don't have to worry after that. The immune system fights the virus no matter what it does. Are CD8 suppression? 
all the viruses are sensitive, resist anything. It just stops them. So it's a universal way of controlling, and that's why our long-term survivors have done so well. It doesn't matter what virus hits them. You can't super-infect. They are protected. But at one point, they advance, and then they have to go on drugs. I mean, we, as I say, we have some that are 78, and they're still doing well. And they say, I'm not taking any drugs. <laughs> but some of them, after 16 years, 18 years, the virus comes up. Well, I usually tell them after 400, 500 is when there's, they really want to put them on. I say, let's look at five, 400. They can stay at 400 for two, three years. And then it comes out now, my clinical colleagues will say, you are doing a disservice to these patients. You should put them on drugs because there should be no virus in their blood. I don't think they have the answer. They don't have the answer. They can accuse me of not having the answer, but I like seeing my patients perfectly healthy, doing what they can, and not have a problem with taking an antiviral drug. Now, the other reason they want to put everybody on antiviral drugs is you reduce the amount of virus in general, not 100%, in seminal fluids and vaginal fluids. So, if they do have a sexual encounter, the chance of transmitting is very low. So by treating everybody, the virus can't go anywhere. It's, that's what they're in. Yeah? Uh, with the multiple um, medicines, uh, could, and with the resistance, could the virus become a sort of a superbug? Yeah, just like bacteria. Absolutely. But uh, the, the, I've been accused now I'm being very frank, but my colleagues, and they're all good friends, they just say, Jay, you're looking at the long range. We're looking at the short range. And I'm trying to say, well, if you only look at the short range, you're in trouble with the long range. You have to take care of both. So uh, the drug companies, of course, will keep working because if they get resistance, they're going to find a way of getting around that, and so you're going to have new drugs, and that's what's happening. That keeps that industry going. Yeah. So since this virus affects the human genome, do you think the CRISPR technologies could be a new way to maybe um, deal with the phase that comes after replication? Or like from RNA to DNA, um, when it incorporates into the human genome? Yeah. Do you think maybe the CRISPR technologies could help with that? Well, you see, the, some of the drugs work against the RNA to DNA. Right, and the, and the DNA getting into the chromosome integrates, blocks that. So they've got everything covered okay. with the drug. <clears throat> what they don't have co covered is a natural immune response, which long-term survivors have. And we have to capitalize on it. And the other thing for a vaccine, I told you about these people that are exposed all the time, and they again, we studied wives of hemophiliac infected hemophiliacs, the wives. And we found there is about, there were about 30% of the wives of hemophiliacs exposed to a seminal fluid that was infected, never got infected. And we found they had our CD8 suppressing activity. Well, after they started practicing safe behavior, they lost this antiviral response. It, was, it took about a year. So that means that, as I, I didn't get into it, innate immune responses don't usually have a memory. So that means they weren't being exposed to viral proteins, so the immune system quieted down. Now, for instance, the prostitutes in Nairobi that were not infected, and they, they tried everything to prove what was the reason. By the way, they never looked for a suppressing activity. It's always very funny. They said we never had enough cells to do it. They when they take, were taken out of the profession, and two years later, some of them went back to being prostitutes, 19 of them got infected. So again, it's home. If the innate immune response is gone, you're not going to have a natural way of protecting. Hmm. And yep. what's the direction of you're working on for boosting the immune system? Well, we. We, we are looking at boosting because you have to be very selective. Mm -hmm. We're looking for our CD8 factor. Yeah. If we can find that, 
then it's a drug there'll be a drug but even better we want to find something that when we we've got to identify the protein because then we can measure it easily we don't have to go and see does it work against the virus that takes two weeks so in order it just doesn't make sense it can't be done but if we could if we have the protein then can you imagine we just give something that tickles the CD8 cell and it continues to make the factor? Which I told you, if you co-colivate a CD8 cell that's lost its ability to do that with a dendritic cell, it starts making it again. It doesn't continue, but it makes it. So that's our aim. Find the factor, find a fast way of determining it's there, and then work on stimulating its production. It's a very interesting. Uh, years ago when I presented this, I had a uh, Chinese doctor come to visit me in my lab. He says, Dr. Li I, I, I know I've got the way of get, getting this factor produced. He opens up a suitcase full of herbs. And he said, all of these activate the immune system. They should be perfect. And I said, we don't want to activate the whole immune system. We only want to activate one cell. Otherwise, you're in trouble. So, so it's a concept you have to really keep in mind. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you.